Well, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Laura Kirby McIntosh. I'm the mother of two children with autism. I'm a high school teacher and president of the Ontario Autism Coalition. Uh, the OAC, just as a refresher, is a, a non-profit political advocacy group dedicated to fighting for better supports and services for people with autism and their families. To my immediate right is Luke Reed, a staff lawyer with Arch Disability Law Centre. And then beside him is David Lepofsky, a visiting professor at Osgoode Hall Law School and the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. He is also a member and past chair of the Special Education Advisory Committee at the Toronto District School Board, Canada's largest school board. David is also a member of the K-12 Education Standards Development Committee, appointed under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. The Ontario Autism Coalition and the AODA Alliance are proud to collaborate on this extremely important issue for at least one-third of a million students with disabilities currently in Ontario-funded schools. We are both widely respected and tenacious grassroots advocacy coalitions with solid track records. And so we join forces here today to ask a provocative question. We want to know. What is the Ford government going to do to rein in the excessive, unfair, and arbitrary power of school principals to exclude students from school? This morning, I'm going to explain the problem that we, that we need the government to fix. Luke Reed will give a lawyer's perspective, emphasizing the cases that Ar the Arch Disability Law Center has handled. And finally, David Lepofsky will describe the two actions that we are calling upon the government to take, actions that the government can take immediately and that don't require major spending. So what is the problem? Well, it is the fundamental right of every Ontario child to an education in an Ontario-funded school. Ontario's outdated Education Act gives every school principal the power and indeed the duty to refuse to admit a student to school if that principal thinks that the student, quote, would, in the principal's judgment, be detrimental to the physical or mental well-being of the pupils. The family has a right to appeal to the school board, but no one ever has to tell the family that they have that right. The supposed risk that the principal is thinking about doesn't have to be serious or substantial or immediate. The Education Act doesn't require the principal to give a reason, nor does it limit how long a student can be excluded from school. We at the Ontario Autism Coalition get calls and emails from parents of children with autism who have been excluded from school on a regular basis. We need to protect the privacy of those families that we deal with, but let me describe a few of their messages. We've heard from families who have been asked to keep their children home from field trips because, their child, uh, because the school doesn't feel that they have the ability to support their child with special needs. We're hearing of families who have had a child who is excluded after one meltdown at school, with no attempt to put supports in place instead. We've heard of cases of children with autism who have been excluded for months at a time, as my own son was. We know that principals call parents to ask them to pick up their child early or drop them off late. We know of situations where the student is only allowed to attend school for one hour a day or 15 minutes a day. We've even now heard of cases where an exclusion lasted for over an entire year. It's important to note, though, that these examples are not limited to children on the autism spectrum. It can affect kids with any disability, behavioral, physical, or developmental. It is left to each principal to decide how to use this power. In over 5,000 schools across Ontario, each principal is essentially allowed to be a law unto themselves. Let me be clear, though. We are not saying that principals are bad people. They are working with an antiquated funding formula, a shortage of qualified staff, and an increasingly complex student population. And they've also been left without clear directions on when and how to exclude, to, sorry, to exercise the power to order a child to stay away from school. So how big of a problem is this? Well, because the Ontario government is not enforcing any requirement for the school boards to gather and report data on this, there's a fog that obscures the whole issue. This is unlike the massive amounts of data which the government requires school boards to report on other topics. 
Yet we know this is a big problem, not just from the calls that we get, but from other sources as well. People for Education, a widely respected and well-known Ontario advocacy group, has reported an increase in the number of elementary and secondary school principals who report recommending a, rec a special education student stay home for at least part of a day. The organization found that 58% of elementary school principals and 48% of high school principals had made such a request, and that was up from 48 and 40% respectively in 2014. Luke will tell you later about corroborating data that Arch has reported. The ministry does not require each school board to use a unique code when marking attendance to record a student's absence due to their principal having excluded them from school. This would provide an instant and easy way to track what is going on and at no additional cost. As a parent of two kids with special education needs, as an educator, and as the president of an organization of parents in the same situation, I want to emphasize how incredibly vulnerable a family feels in the face of the might and the resources of a publicly funded school board and all of their lawyers. Quite often, parents don't know the rules or the law or their rights, even if they do, they too often don't have access to the lawyers to advocate for them. They are terrified and they are distressed. This is not a new problem, but until recent coverage sparked by the Globe and Mail and echoed by others in the media, it's now a subject finally getting public attention. Three months ago, our organization met with Conservative MPP Sam Oosterhoff, the parliamentary assistant to the Education Minister, and we presented a full briefing note and discussed this issue in detail. On December 13th of last year, we wrote the Minister of Education, Lisa Thompson, to flag the issue and to ask for a meeting. So far, radio silence. So we are here today to call for action. Now, let's hear from Luke and David, and we'll take your questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, as uh, Laura said, my name is Luke Reed. I'm a staff lawyer at Arch Disability Law Center. Um, ARCH is a specialty legal aid clinic uh, focusing on disability law. Um, one of the major focuses of our work is uh, tackling a lot of the barriers that students with disabilities face in the education system. Um, I just want to thank right off the bat the Ontario Autism Coalition and the AODA Alliance for uh, inviting me here today to share uh, briefly some of what ARCH is seeing. Uh, when for the from the people that call us um, so as I mentioned uh, arch gets uh, lots of calls and requests from persons with disabilities for advice and representation on a wide range of issues um, one of our primary and uh, largest practice areas is education law and again that is focused on uh, removing the barriers uh, that students with disabilities face uh, and one of the most significant and recurring issues is this issue of exclusion. Um, exclusion comes in a variety of different forms. Uh, principals can formally exclude uh, students under Section 2651M of the Education Act, uh, as Laura mentioned, and it gives them a broad range of powers to do that. They have a lot of discretion in that area. Um, at other times, though, exclusions are done very informally. Students are just asked not to come in, or parents are just asked to come pick up their children early. They're not, they're told that they basically just can't come back uh, until the principal okays it. Um, finally, the other type of exclusion that often occurs is when a principal shortens a student's school day. As Laura mentioned, you know, this can turn into a vanishingly small school day, up to 15 minutes a day. Um, and I have some statistics later, which I would like to talk about uh, in association with that. Um, either way, though, if a student isn't properly accommodated, if they're being excluded for a disability-related reason and they're not properly accommodated, it's unjustified. School boards have an obligation under the Human Rights Code of Ontario to ac properly accommodate students so to facilitate their meaningful access to an education. I just want to be clear though, we're not talking about situations in which parents or students you know, are requesting that they be able to take an absence. We're talking about situations where students and families want 
to go to school and they're not able to do that because somebody in the school board is telling them no. These situations often occur in the context of a long history of accommodation problems where it's become clear that more needs to be done to help a student better manage at school but no steps have been taken. Uh, as Laura mentioned, there is no formal legislative or policy limit on how long these exclusions can last. It's sort of the Wild West in some ways. Um, there's often a marked absence of due process during this, this exclusion process. We've seen cases where families aren't given reasons for why their child is, is excluded. Uh, we've seen cases where families aren't told that they have a right to appeal those exclusions. We also have seen cases where families aren't told that the student who's excluded has a right to alternative forms of education, like tutoring at home during that exclusion. However, I really want to emphasize here that the primary issue is often one of accommodation and whether the school board is properly fulfilling its obligation to accommodate students with disabilities. To give you just a brief sense of the scale of the problem, Arch and its partners uh, recently undertook some research specific to students with intellectual disabilities. Uh, and during that, more than half of all the parents surveyed uh, reported that their child's day had been shortened and that on average, the children lost approximately four hours out of a six hour school day. That's two thirds of their education that they lost on an ongoing basis because their day had been shortened. More than 25% of parents of that sample reported that they had been told not to bring their student to school one day. And almost half of all parents reported that they had been unable to bring their child to school uh, on a day because of a lack of accommodations. It should be clear, based on this, this is an ongoing and prevalent problem for students with disabilities and is the result of many of systemic problems in our, in our education system, not the least of which is problem problematic exclusionary practices. We found in many cases that a lawyer can be quite helpful in getting a school board to rescind an exclusion. It's not always successful, but a lawyer, you know, is, is obviously a great resource in those cases. However, we're very cognizant of the fact that not all families have access to a lawyer. Not all families know they can call Arch or some of the other specialty legal clinics who deal with exclusion um, for advice or representation. So despite the fact that a lot of school boards may not be living up to their duty to accommodate students with disabilities, uh, exclusion remains a persistent problem in our education system. So I'd just like to pass it over to David now. Oh, sorry, take the phone. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act uh, Alliance is delighted to partner with the uh, Ontario Autism Coalition uh, here today uh, and to continue our efforts to press for equality for students uh, with disabilities in Ontario's schools. Uh, people with disabilities live in a society that is designed as if uh, only people without disabilities are going to be there and our education system uh, is just one example of that. We uh, lead the campaign to try to get the provincial government to effectively uh, implement the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act to tear down barriers across our society that uh, obstruct people with disabilities from fully participating in Ontario life. That includes efforts uh, that we lead to try to tear down the barriers facing students with disabilities in Ontario's education system. The power in Ontario's Education Act of a principal to unilaterally exclude a student from school a burden borne in no small part by students with disabilities. The power to do it without having to give reasons, without any uh, definite period uh, for it to end, without having to report it internally within the school board, without it having to be effectively tracked. This is an example of a significant barrier. Well, it's not good enough for us to uh, point out a problem. We need to offer solutions. That's what I'm going to do. But before I do that, I want to mention that it's hard to track what's really going on out there. 
I have a team of wonderful uh, Osgood Hall law students who volunteered to undertake a survey of all our school boards just to find out, do they have a policy? What is it? Uh, do they collect data? If so, what is it? How do they mark attendance? That survey is in the works right now, but so far what we're finding is it's hard to even find out answers to those basic questions from our school boards. That's unacceptable. It adds to the fog over this entire process that you heard about. Well, we'd like to offer two specific actions that the Ford government should take today. And it's timely that we're discussing it today because at least according to Twitter, uh, uh, the Ford government is focusing a great deal of attention on, on, on mental health issues today. And this is in no small part, part of issues confronting students with mental health issues, among others in our school system. Well, what are the solutions? First, we are calling on the Minister of Education, uh, the Honorable Lisa Thompson, to immediately convene a summit on exclusions from school, a summit that would include representation fr uh, from organizations uh, of parents, particularly parents of kids with disabilities and other parents who may be uh, families that may be affected uh, by this, uh, a consultation that will bring to the same table uh, teachers, principals, school boards, the key players, let's get together and see if we can, and students, of course, and let's see if we can find some common ground and some common sense solutions that the government can implement, whether through changing legislation or changing policy. In the meantime, uh, we need immediate action to at least rein in the excesses that are inherent in Section 265 sub 1M of the Education Act. So we're calling on the uh, Minister of Education now to issue a policy directive. They issue lots of them to school boards. It's not a big deal. They've done it before in other areas, and they can do it again. A policy direction that will simply impose some interim common sense constraints on how this power is used. Here are just a few ideas. How about requiring that if a principal is going to refuse to admit a student from school uh, under this provision, whether they claim it's formal or informal, whether it's normally done by a phone call or something more structured, they got to put it in writing immediately. How about requiring that they give the family the reason for it? How about agreeing that as an interim step, such an exclusion from school cannot be longer than five days unless the school board can justify extending it for another five days and so on. So we don't run the risk of these indefinite uh, extent, uh, 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 refusals to admit that we've heard about. How about requiring that the principal, if they do this, report internally within the school board that they've excluded a student, who it is, what the reasons were, and how long it's going to go on for. How about also having school boards aggregate that data and reporting it publicly? Finally, how about, as uh, we heard from Laura, having the province require school boards to use a unique attendance code to mark attendance. In our press release, we provide a link to a policy direction that the government already provides to school boards about how to mark attendance generally. But what they do with refusals to admit, I'm not saying this is intentional, but the effect is clear, is they obfuscate, they blur, they fog the whole issue because the same code for refusal to admit uh, a day uh, that a student misses at school because of refusal uh, to admit the student to school also applies to other kinds of absences. Well, if the ministry just amended that policy and said, here's the unique code to be used whenever a student misses uh, time at school due to a, a principal refusing to admit the student to school, uh, then that would provide a capacity of the school board itself and the province to push a button and immediately see how many school days are being lost to this. A and that would be a helpful starting point. Now, we'd like to go further in being constructive. We've said that there should be a summit. We said that there should be some immediate short-term uh, uh, common sense constraints put on this power. We've got uh, an option or a, a possibility uh, that this could all be built on. Uh, as you heard earlier, I'm a member of the Special Education Advisory Committee of the Toronto District School Board and its former chair from uh, during the years 2016 and 2017. Our Special Education Advisory Committee uh, did a uh, review of this very issue 
And a year ago, we passed a detailed four-page recommendation to the Toronto District School Board in the absence of provincial action in this area on how the Toronto District School Board can rein that in. Now, they're deliberating on that next Monday's Special Education Advisory Committee meeting, uh, February uh, 4th, will include an opportunity for us to give feedback on a draft policy that the TDSB is considering. But it, at least the recommendations that we formulated would provide a good template for a basis for these discussions, a good starting point, and uh, we strongly uh, encourage that. Let me just turn to one big picture issue to conclude. Uh, this is part of a bigger problem. This is part of a problem that our school board, uh, our, pardon me, that our education system is replete with many barriers impeding students with disabilities. A longer term solution, not something that uh, uh, can be done tomorrow, but a longer term solution is enacting an education accessibility standard under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act that would detail the barriers that need to be removed in our school system uh, and by when. The uh, previous government appointed a standards development committee to develop recommendations for that. I'm serving on the K-12 Education Standards Development Committee. The, uh, when in opposition, the Conservative Party supported the need for that kind of regulation and pressed the previous government to act far more quickly. Since the uh, June election, however, our work has been frozen. It's all been shut down. We're all on hold. And we've been pressing the, gover the uh, Ford government for months to lift the freeze, let us get to the table, and let us be able to help them discover and address the many barriers, not just this one, uh, uh, that are uh, uh, inherent in our education system so that they can take action to remove them. It's important that that uh, ban, or pardon me, that that freeze on our work uh, be lifted and be lifted immediately. Let me conclude by just clarifying one thing. It is fabulous that the Globe and Mail uh, uh, published some leading reporting on this uh, earlier this month, but there's one thing in those articles that uh, I'd like to address and clear up. Those articles uh, uh, not only address the problem of students being excluded from school, uh, or uh, the technical language of the legislation being refused to be admitted to school, but they also got into the debate about whether students with disabilities uh, and when students with disabilities should be included in a regular classroom and when they should be educated in a separate special education classroom. These are two completely different issues. Yes, there are debates over when and uh, uh, students with disabilities uh, are included in a regular classroom and there's lots to discuss in that important area. Um, and Ontario has uh, lots of progress to make in that area. However, the refusal to admit issue is completely separate. When the principal refuses to admit a student to school, that means they're refused, they're excluded from everything at that school. They're excluded from the regular classroom, they're excluded from a special education classroom. They're excluded from everything. And a debate over reigning, or a discussion over reigning in the excesses of Section 265 of the Education Act shouldn't be distracted uh, uh, or, or held back by discussions over inclusion versus special education classes. They are two separate issues, and it's important that they not be uh, confused. Anyway, we'd welcome your questions and be happy to provide further information. Laura? Hey. Hi. What's your What's your name? Sorry, I'm Victoria. I'm with the Globe and Mail. Okay. Um, I'm curious whether or not uh, you've had any feedback on this from either the principals' uh, council or the teachers' unions of any kind um, on these recommendations. I making. did. I did reach out to uh, the head of the principals' council after I did a, an interview on on Metro Morning, um, and suggested that we grab a coffee and, and talk. I, I haven't heard back from him. Um, I am in regular contact with teachers' federations um, and QP, the, the union that represents education assistance, and we're continuing to dialogue about, um, about exclusion and, and about the, the challenges of inclusion. Um, so those... Well, essentially, I mean, I started making the rounds last year, uh, talking to, to all of them and, and saying, you know, look, we're seeing 
on our end as, as parents problems where our kids are being excluded, our kids are being restrained, our kids are not being accommodated properly, um, and our kids are acting out. And they're seeing the flip side of that as workers, and, and I understand this because I'm a teacher, so I'm on both sides of this desk. Um, their workers are, are seeing kids uh, increasingly acting out in school, and some of them are getting injured. And so I've had some good success in, in speaking to Labour, saying, look, we're all in this together, and you're just looking at the other side of, of the same coin, basically. So how do we partner together to, to try to address this? Um, and I, I, I think the idea of a summit would, would bring us together. I think in a lot of ways really what's needed is for for parents to have a chance to sit down and, and talk to education workers, including principals, to say, here's what a day in my life looks like. Um, and then for principals and education workers to say, and here's the challenges we're facing. Because as I said earlier, like it's not... I don't, I, I'm definitely not okay with how often principals are using this power, but I understand the systemic issues that are forcing them to, to sometimes reach into their toolbox and pull out that particular weapon. Um, I just, let me just add a couple of thoughts. Um, for one thing, we want to emphasize, as, as, as Laura just said, that principals are kind of uh, caught in the middle here because the province gives them not only this power, but the section... 265 says they have they have a duty to refuse to admit students to school in uh, in these situations and then it provides inadequate uh, clearly inadequate constraints and direction that's where the province could intervene uh, longer term by amending the provision but in the shorter term by a uh, a policy direction and they do that in lots of other ways and that would give principals a lot more guidance a lot more comfort and so each school, uh, over 5,000 of them, doesn't become its own little fiefdom kingdom or whatever uh, with, the, uh, as Laura said earlier, a law unto themselves. Um, and the, uh, so that, that's, that's part one. The, the other thing in terms of the broader issue, uh, just so you know, we, we uh, the AODA Alliance has led the campaign to get the provincial government to enact an education accessibility standard to address barriers broadly facing students with disabilities and we got letters of support from the uh, a number of the major teachers unions the uh, element ETFO the elementary teachers federation of ontario the ontario secondary school teachers federation the ontario english catholic teachers association like a number of these uh, organizations came forward uh, and, and people working in the front line of the education system saying to the province you know we need more action to tear down the barriers facing the students we teach the students with disabilities that we teach so uh, we see that there are a lot of allies to work with on this uh, but we just can't leave the status quo in place it's just not uh, sustainable if you th if you think about it from a a, a rights perspective um, and you think of the, the image of the scales of justice, what, what's really in conflict here is the rights of com students sometimes with complex special needs um, on, one, on the one hand and what the principals will call the safety concerns on the other hand. And the problem right now is it's tipped entirely on, on one side. And so all the principal has to do is mention the word you know, safety of the other students and you, know, you can have a situation like, like my son's where he had one meltdown and wound up being excluded for six months. Well, it's completely disproportionate. And so what we're trying to do is, is, is balance that out. I understand the, the pressures that, that schools are facing, but we have to, we have to fight to, to, you know, to advocate for the extra supports that are needed in schools. Um, and I, I think we're gonna be able to ultimately forge an alliance where parents and teachers um, and students are all on the same side on this because it, you know, we all want what's best for our kids, and, and that is for all kids to access a meaningful public education. I could just give you a couple of other points. It, whenever whenever it, uh, a principal or anyone starts conceptualizing this as a clash of rights, mm. the important thing is to do is to not leap to that conclusion too quickly. Yeah. And it may well be that there are ways to reconcile all of them. So, that, for example, if the student with a disability, if effectively accommodated as the school board is required, would present no risk to anyone, much less a serious or substantial risk, 
then we could resolve this without ever having to deal with any conflict of rights or any exclude. Mm -hmm. the, the, but the other thing is because this is left to each principle and this is can be undocumented, these could be issued in a way or in circumstances where, where there's no risk at all. Um, uh, the Toronto District School Board has said at our Special Education Advisory Committee that one of the circumstances where they consider it is if there's a, there been an incident and there's a police investigation going on. Now, I'm oversimplifying, but I, uh, what, what is their policy or their, their approach, I should say. But this provision is not meant and should not be used to facilitate police investigations. There's no, why should a student be told not only to stay home from his or her school, but any school, while police are, are interviewing witnesses? They could interview witnesses elsewhere. I mean, they could, if they need to put their tape down and take crime scene information, that doesn't mean that the whole school has to be, uh, you know, uh, forbidden to the student. Do you follow me? So it's part of the, fact that we're kind of in the Wild West here is, uh, is or part of the result of it is that this could be used in any wide range of circumstances, as you heard from Luke and, and Laura, it is. Well, when you're requesting a, a, an immediate policy directive, I guess the question is why uh, are your requests not inclusive of um, extra resources, where you're saying the issue is, is schools are dealing with these uh, this lack of resources, if you're well, asking I, for a policy I, It's directive. very simple. The, the, the first thing's first, okay? Uh, obviously, added resources can always help, and also examining how existing resources are allocated can also help, but immediate action, we don't need to wait for new resources for a principal to give the family a reason for telling the child that they can't come to school, code. or putting it in writing and writing a letter so it's yeah. documented for reporting to their supervisors, for having uh, the attendance code. The various measures that, that I listed are measures they could implement tomorrow that make common sense, that don't require added resources, and that at least could be curbing constraint the the excesses, some of the excesses of this power, while at, while we sit down at the table and look for bigger fixes um, and longer term fixes, which you know if they open the door to issues about new resources or reallocating resources, we can have those discussions. But the moment in government that you say, oh, we we also want new resources, that especially in current economic situation and the current uh, discussions in terms of funding, that's going to slow progress down. And we need some immediate action. So that, that's why the, the immediate two asks are the ones that we've put forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Sne, with Sne. Queen's Park Briefing. Hi. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that you, you've kind of seen both sides. Yeah. Um, in that respect, do you think that there are situations where it's appropriate to exclude a student um, maybe not for six months but for a portion of time oh, that's a hard question to answer I'm going to take a traffic try that. uh sure uh, I have asked at the Toronto District School Board special education meetings the staff at open meetings can you tell me a situation where you cannot have a child excluded uh, uh, prevented from coming to school by way of a suspension or an expulsion, and you need to resort to this power. And I have yet to hear a clear and convincing example. Mm -hmm. I don't mean them pointing to a particular child, I mean a hypothetical. Yeah. But even if there is some emergency need, even if there's some emergency need, it would not be indefinite. Mm -hmm. It would not be uh, without reasons. Mm -hmm. It would not be without proper written notification. It would not be without telling the family they have a right to appeal. It would be with an immediate expeditious opportunity for review because the burden on a child to not go to school mm -hmm. uh, is pretty profound. So the debate doesn't have to be, should it be there at all? There are constraints that could limit it um, um, uh, and that could uh, narrow this discussion profoundly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, we turned to them and asked, and, and the only example I was given at the time was this police investigation thing, and I don't uh, genuinely, and uh, I don't think that that's, uh, Luke, you might want to speak to this, but I don't think that's appropriate use of the Education Act. It's not a criminal law enforcement statute. It's a, a statute aimed at educating children. 
I, th I think what, what we're concerned about, too, is that, that this is being used by principals because they don't want to do all of the paperwork that's involved in a suspension or an expulsion. But there's also complexities here, right? You're, you're not supposed to suspend or ex even exclude or expel a student for behavior that's related to their disability. Right? You don't you don't punish a kid with Tourette's for swearing and then suspend them. Well, if a child with autism has meltdowns, um, do you suspend them because they're violent? There's there's complexities here, but I think what we're seeing is principals going well. If I issue a suspension or an expulsion, then I got to do the letter. I got there's a whole appeal process. It could be really long. What what I'm concerned about is the number of uh, of parents who, even like me, had never even heard that exclusion was a thing that existed, um, who may have a language barrier, who may not know their rights or, or be willing to take on the education system, who are simply told by the big boss at the school, you have to keep your kid home. And then the burden shifts to them. And, and we need to talk about that part of the story here too, because the exclusion obviously impacts the child first and, and foremost, but it also impacts the entire family. Because if the child can't go to school, someone has to be with that kid. So that means usually a parent has to stop working. And, and, and in my case, that's what I had to do. Um, and, and that places a financial burden on the family. And then the stress and the anxiety of knowing that this is indefinite and you have no idea when your child's going to be back in school and then dealing with the separation and the and the anxiety that your your child is going through and trying to support them um it's it's a it, it's a huge ripple effect that goes through the the family and and the child missing their friends not understanding you know when am i going to be able to go back mommy i don't know the other if, thing so uh, uh, let me just do okay uh, uh, the other thing is if you you put the question uh, which is a, a a valid question you know are there circumstances when they should ever be done that's what we can discuss at the summit that's where if we get principals and teachers and school boards at the table um, we can discuss that and give the government some advice on that uh, but if you look at our short-term fixes in the policy directive we're seeking we're not saying uh, in that to immediately stop its use ever. We're saying put uh, put some common sense constraints on it that are basic fairness uh, while we figure out what the future of this should be. Sorry, Luke? Um, I just wanted to just step in just in terms of our experience in the use of exclusions and suspensions and expulsions. Um, typically our experience is that principals will use suspensions but exclusions are often invoked as a way to circumvent the time limits uh, that are placed on a suspension so you cannot suspend a student for more than 20 days and so we've seen a number of cases where a principal will uh, at the end of that 20 days say well no we need to exclude this student further because uh, they can't they still can't be in school um, so uh, we often see it as a way to sidestep some of the procedural protections that are built into the suspension process. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's basically the how 265 is being used. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you as well that you mentioned accommodation is one of the issues. Um, what would you like to see on that front? What are um, things that you think would help? Let me offer you a couple. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's that's what we need the education accessibility standard to do, because kids with disabilities go to a school system that's designed uh, uh, without regard to their being there initially, uh, and so we need to deal with a lot of uh, individual accommodation. The Human Rights Code, and the Charter of Rights, provide, impose, give give students with disabilities a right to be accommodated in this school system a duty to accommodate them. The problem right now is that they then have to, if they, they can't get what they need, they've got to go and uh, uh, take on the school system. There is not a mandatory effective internal appeal process to even raise these problems if they're not getting the accommodations needed. The resort has to be to lawyer up and go to the Human Rights Tribunal and who wants to do that to take on their school. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it's costly, it takes a lot of time, it's, it's, it's uh, confrontational, and it's uh, burdensome. And by the time you get a decision, they, your kid might be aged out of school. And so uh, th that's part of the problem. And, and you think of the vicious cycle that comes from what, what, what Luke is describing. A, a child has accommodation needs, they don't get their needs, so they act out at school. So the school says you've got to be excluded. I mean, that, that, if that chain of events happens, that's just unfair. The exclusion is rooted in the failure of the, the school board to, to accommodate. If that happens, now no, we're not saying every student isn't accommodated or anything like that, but it's that risk that this um, unbridled and arbitrary power um, could allow. Um, I, I will tell you that if you want just one example that relates to our activity, the, the, the government's focus today on mental health, so you've heard the reference to special education and students with special education needs. The definition of special education students in the Education Act is out of date and it's antiquated and it does not include all mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. It only includes a mental health condition if you reach the point of being a behavior problem. Mm -hmm. So the Human Rights Code protects students with any disability including a mental health condition whether or not they're a behavior problem. Are you with mm -hmm. me? But the special education law doesn't kick in and provide you anything under the special education regime until your mental health condition is, uh, reaches a point, if it does, of a behavior problem. Well, that's, that makes no sense. Uh, and we've been asking the government to fix this for, for years. Uh, that, so, so now there are efforts to address mental health issues in school. But the, if you talk to special education officials, when they look to the definitions of who they're supposed to serve, it does not include um, uh, uh, students with any mental health condition. It only relates to those who uh, reach the point of a behavior issue. Mm -hmm. And as, as that applies to autism, you see a, a lot of people on the autism spectrum that also suffer from high levels of anxiety. And often it's the anxiety that's, that's driving that behavior. Um, one thing in, in terms of, of accommodations that, that are needed immediately, I, I think my community would agree with me that the one thing that's most lacking is an adequate number of EAs and trained EAs. Um, the, you know, the idea that you're going to somehow send your child to, to school and they're going to have a one-to-one -one EA, it, it, like, it, it's incredibly rare. Um, and some of our kids need that one-to-one -one support. They don't need it for the entire 12 years, but when they need it, they really need it. Um, and there's a huge shortage of education assistance, and they need more uh, rigorous training. There, there, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, um, just to add, I think, to, to what David and Laura are saying, um, what we always look for in schools is sort of a more proactive process, yeah. a process by which uh, because you're, you know, you're tracking these sort of exclusions, you're tracking uh, behavior problems and all that sort of thing, that you can nip some of these problems in the bud before uh, they sort of escalate to where you're looking at months-long problem or months-long exclusions. Um, you know, we think that's the most, the best way to manage that. And part of the reason we think that tracking is so important um, because if you're not tracking these problems, it's very difficult to address them before they escalate. Look, you had arch tried freedom of information requests to school boards to get data on how often they use the power, right? I did, I did, and of the ten largest school boards uh, in this province, at, I should clarify at the time, only uh, two years ago, 2016 I think, at the time only two were tracking formal exclusions. Hmm. Um, I think since then one or two other boards have have instituted an additional policy, but uh, it just goes to show that this this issue was going under the radar uh, for a long time up until now, and, and very few boards uh, were really making a concerted effort to to keep track of how often this power was being used. And stay tuned, because when we get report back from the law students who are volunteering <coughs> to work with me on this, we'll make that report public. We're, it's still a work in progress. The autism in mom in me is, is giggling because, of course, the, the first step of applied behavioral analysis is the collection of data. <laughs> you observe behavior over a period of time, you track it, and, and the, the biggest challenge that we've got on this issue is that there is an appalling lack of data. 
Um, I'm not suggesting that school boards are deliberately trying to hide how often they're excluding students, um, but I will say they are not being fully transparent. Um, I just wanted to confirm that you haven't received any correspondence back from the minister's office no, or ma Mr. Osterhoff. No, ma'am. I can give you a copy of the briefing note that we presented to them if you're interested. And, uh, and the letter that, uh, that we sent, I, I brought copies of both of those. And so. we can show you what we've sent to each school board. Yeah. Uh, one of the students is here who's working on the team, mm -hmm. and we can show you what we've, we've sent to them. Mm -hmm. We have one school board right back and just simply say, no, they won't answer us. Okay. And they, they did not like the form or the way we were presenting it or whatever, but it's a list of questions. Yeah. Any other questions? Just in, nothing else. In, in conclusion, I, I just I want to emphasize one thing. It's, it would be um, easy for some looking at this to go, well, a kid's acting up, other kids are at risk. Keep the kid who's acting up out of the classroom or out of the school. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would seem like, okay, like, what's wrong with that? But the thing is, this provision isn't limited to that. And it also doesn't provide the kind of oversight to make sure that situations like that are all it's being applied to. Uh, and it, so, so it's, it, it, it talks about somebody, the, the principal basically thinking or forming a view that the, the, the student in question's presence at school would be detrimental to the mental or physical uh, health of other, of other people. I mean, it's not immediate risk, it's not a clear risk. It's not a substantial risk. Um, it just got, has to be detrimental. And it doesn't require the school on its face to first try to accommodate the needs of the student uh, that they're concerned about to see if they can eliminate that risk. And we've heard from Luke that, if, that often the problems are presented where they didn't, and they solve it by getting the accommodation in place, at least when Arch intervenes. So it, it, it's... It's 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 wrong to and it's wrong. It would be wrong for the government to think of it in in an oversimplified way that way. And that's why we want to get to that summit. And this government's got fiscal constraints. That's not a big expenditure to just get us to the table and get us talking, yeah. and for them to listen. And it's not a big constraint to impose the uh, policy directive that we're proposed that we're suggesting. Can I just include one final plug? Let's go. Uh, if you're looking for uh, the stats that uh, I was citing, uh, it's all in our report, If Inclusion Means Everyone, Why Not Me, um, which is available on Arch's website. And we have a link to it in the electronic version of our news release. Oh, okay. good. Yes. And as I said, I've got, uh, I've got copies of the letter and the briefing note and also the, uh, the TDSB um, motion that, uh, that David mentioned earlier. So if any of those documents are helpful, just come up and help yourself. And if, you, if you come to the Special Education Advisory Committee meeting at 5050 Young Street, open to the public Monday, February uh, 4th from 7 to 9, um, you can see us having a chance to uh, feedback to the TDSB on what they're proposing as their draft new policy or procedure in this area. Thanks for coming Thank today. you all. Thank you. Thank you.